pandemic, the really cool thing about what we do is that we can have an impact at so many different levels. And it's always surprising when somebody approaches me and says, oh, I love that article and it helped me think about this in this way. I think it is important to have a variety of different kinds of people talking about different kinds of things. I'm interested in the world. So I'm interested in science and arts and music. We can make a bigger voice when we are in a room together. So that diversity uh, amongst us makes us more powerful, makes us more complete. Only when you can connect your intuitive thoughts to logical reasoning, you can make the progress that is not just incremental, but is frontier changing. As bizarre as he may seem, Donald Trump is not that exceptional within the framework of Republican Party politics over the past you know, three decades or so. It teaches us that powerful people are willing to use racial, religious prejudices and fears to distract a good segment of the electorate from the real issues that confront us in terms of economic inequality and social justice. The main point of the piece was about the perils of focusing really on cost effectiveness and in the process forgetting about what is our purpose, which is really to provide safe drinking water and to protect the health of the citizens of this town. If you look historically over uh, what's happened in cancer research since the war on cancer was declared, there hasn't been as much progress as we need uh, to get there. And despite the significant new pledge of funding, it still really falls short of what's going to, to make a mark. We're contacted constantly by patients, mothers of patients, children, families, begging us for new approaches to cancer and new therapeutics, and we simply need more, more dollars to do the research we need to do to, to fight the war on cancer. a political campaign now, a lot of ideas that are in circulation are based on a faulty knowledge of history. And so from my perspective, I think it's really important that people like me are involved in, in public conversations, not only to inform, but also to, to guide debate to maybe a more complicated level than it might be. We commonly assume that first impressions matter a lot and that it's hard to change them. And there are some circumstances in which we can really easily and durably and robustly update even our kind of non-conscious first impressions of people. It was picked up by Scientific American and Newsweek and a couple of other places, so I'm happy that there's a wider audience for some of the general ideas that, that we look at in my lab. The big picture for me is a day that we will come that we don't need to talk about uh, diversity or underrepresented minorities. And the more uh, we work on removing the barriers, the more successful we will be as academic institutions in providing the education and the preparation of the future. Justine and I found a really fun point of collaboration, a really fun connection. Um, so, you know, I study children and their cognitive and social development, and she studies wine. I have a hypothesis that when students learn about wine, it sometimes can reduce their binge drinking. And so we started talking because some of my research is on the cultural significance of food selection. It was great. It was fun to work with someone else and incorporate you know, information that I hadn't even thought about before. What we wrote was better than what either one of us would have written by ourselves. And so now we're going to start a research project because I've needed a social scientist uh, for this. And so we're going to start looking at, at whether this is real. If you look at people who are at the forefront of the fight against inequality, you are going to see very often that they are younger people. The levels of inequality among this band of youth are more severe, more, much wider than they are among the, the older people. I'd love for policymakers and others to think more about the message that school buildings are sending. If they're in a school building that is not well maintained, that is poorly designed, 
students and teachers may be getting messages about how the larger society views what they do. I'd like to have a scientific legacy in which I've produced greater understanding for the biological mechanism of chronic fatigue syndrome and greater understanding that we need to support the victims of this illness. This is a very misunderstood disease and uh, many patients go through years without getting a proper diagnosis. All of these other news articles were coming out about this journal whitewashing in Hollywood and then it occurred to me that I do have some research data that I could bring in to this op-ed. We sent it to Women's E! News, and honestly, within an hour, the woman <laughs> sent back, she said, oh, yeah, we want to snap this up. I said, wow. At the very end of her last email, she said, we enjoyed working with you. Please come again. Yeah. I wrote uh, an op-ed for the Gray Matter section in the New York Times, really talking about the social advantages of being in a multilingual environment. I got a lot of feedback and people sending me emails with just these incredible stories about their own bilingual exposure. I was invited to be on NPR with Robert Siegel on All Things Considered, which was really exciting. Um, and then I was also on the Brian Lair show on WNYC. There's even somebody who's a member of the New York City Council who was really interested in talking about efforts to promote, um, you know, teaching more than one language in New York City public schools. To experience some of these social benefits, children don't have to become completely bilingual. Katherine Kinsler is Associate Professor of Psychology at Cornell University. provide that spark that makes other people want to narrate the world, wow, that's an amazing legacy. It's really important to have many voices represented so that we're not just telling one side of history, especially when you speak truth to power. It's not just important to say it, but I think there's a moral imperative to say it. Ignorance about the past doesn't help any of us and I'd like to think that I have contributed in some small part to you know, a greater store of knowledge about the past that will be helpful to other people and help them see the modern day with more empathy and complexity. It's been incredibly inspiring and mind expanding to uh, have this conversation with the Public Voices Fellows and our mentors and tap into our expertise in creative ways so that we can make our work available to wider audiences. Look at the talent, look at the number of people in the room, and really it's amazing. I feel so inspired, so challenged, and so successful.